Welcome Commanders, this is Spartan Vanguard Oni here talking about Halo Ground Command and a bit of prep work behind that. So please forgive the lackluster desk, I'm stationed on the UNSC's yesterday's news until my prowler is updated with some new ablative gear. So that's why I'm in this dodgy room, also known as my living room. So as we all know, Spartan Games has released a new Halo Ground Command, uh, which is a fantastic 1/100th scale miniature game. There's also the 1 2 or 20 thousand scale Halo Fleet Battles, which has just had its first birthday, or is just coming up, can't recall which. Either way, those of us that have been playing Fleet Battle should have a few skills up our sleeves now for painting, modeling, and seeing stuff go from the box onto the table. However, with this influx of new players, we've got an opportunity to try and showcase some of what we've learned along the way. You don't necessarily have to paint any of your ships in order to actually play the game. However, I personally believe that seeing elements of painted ships meeting on the battlefield is much more attractive and much more engaging. Painting your fleets, painting your army gives you an opportunity to personalize your force and truly make it yours. So instead of it just being uh, out-of-the-box models, which there's nothing wrong with, it really can become an incredible experience for yourself and a chance to learn a new artistic talent, something that's a bit of a dying art outside, uh, you know, art circles and things like that. Not, you know, refined art circles, but as in, you've got to be a bit interested to want to paint. It does take quite a bit of time, especially in today's days of, of uh, instant gratification. Now, Halo is a gargantuan universe. It really is. And the player base is huge. It's a multimedia universe. It exists in books, movies, video games, TV series, animes, comics, you know, you name it, Halo's basically got its fingers in it. It's uh, really spread out massively. Now, for those of us with previous wargaming experience, it's pretty easy to just switch from Lord of the Rings, Warhammer, and then, you know, transplant those skills onto painting ships. So you can just quickly go to to. But this game does have a lot of appeal for lots of different people, lots of different players, and a bit of a difficulty for those of you coming from the FPS universe. So you just play Halo, thought, hey, this is a cool miniature, you know, I wouldn't mind giving that a go. You've unboxed the fleet, you've played the game perhaps. If not, don't worry, I'll put up some videos on how to do that. And you're thinking, how exactly can I paint? What can I do to do this to make this work? If you're interested in that, I'm going to be putting up some dedicated Halo uh, videos on how to paint ships, how to paint units, different factions, colour schemes, Swords of Sang Helios. It won't just be a standard run-of-the-mill uh, purple covenant. There will be branching out then and plenty of opportunities to see lots of new stuff. Now, you don't have to pet your fleet or your army in order to play the game, of course, but it does add a lot. Sticking with that, here's some of the equipment that you're going to need if you're actually interested in heading that way. First thing you're gonna want is a cutting mat. Sprues and various aspects of the game will require a knife and will recover, uh, require clippers, things like that, just to get them off. And it can be a simple, as removing elements from this to more complicated ones where you really have to be careful lest you break the things off. Uh, I'm referring in particular to the rear section of the SDV Corvettes, which if you don't put, uh, take off in the right order, can very, very, very easily snap off. So this video is designed to give you just a bit of an idea of why I'm making it, why I'm going to do this video series, and also to introduce you to some of the supplies that you're going to want. So a cutting board, is fundamental. Next best thing you want, a pair of clippers. It's fantastic, just for knocking things off. A knife can actually be quite rough on the model because a lot of times you need purchase on both sides to get the cut in there. So a pair of clippers can both expedite the process and also uh, just give you a very clean cut in a relatively short space of time. However, there's usually flash left over, which is where we step in with a knife of some kind. Now, a scalpel, uh, so a modeling scalpel, is also a really good investment. I haven't got one here to show you, but they're quite easy to get. But a utility knife in itself can just be very helpful in really trimming down those cuts because the clippers cannot get in as close. It can get it off the sprue for you, but just can't get that close. After that, you're going to want files. Filing down uh, any of the bumps that you've left there, so even things that you may be a bit too nervous approaching with a knife, you might want to get in closer. Increasing surface area, so for gluing things, extra purchase on flat models, various aspects like that. Removing mold lines, so when you have miniatures, 
uh, they're basically made by pressing two things together over a middle thing. So whether that's resin or plastic, two things pressed together and, and some of the excess can sometimes show out. Next thing you'll probably want is a brush of various sorts. Mine looks a bit fancy, it's not. It's like a two dollar thing that came in a massive pack. But a toothbrush will do the job. Now this is for washing in miniatures, in particular resin. Resin has a releasing agent on the outside and it's very, very important that you uh, wash them in warm water, not hot, warm, uh, with a bit of soap. But even just warm water, using bristles. These are quite rigid, so they do the job quite nicely. And this is for more delicate, fine, fine things. And just all over the model. Just don't be too rough, you don't want to scratch it, but yeah, you do want to remove that releasing agent. Otherwise, when you go to paint it, paint won't stick, or worse, it will stick and then later it'll come off, and you'll have to redo all your work. Now, these are the, the things that basically get your model from the packet to being built. In addition to that, you've also got super glue. Now, that's pretty standard. Obviously, you're going to need something to stick it together on a more permanent basis. Blue tack. Now, this can be used uh, in various places, so I'm just trying to think what else it could be called. It's just a sticky thing that you use for putting up posters. I don't know, because it might have a different name in different countries, but... I also use it as a masking agent when I'm airbrushing or painting. If I wanted to make like a particularly hard edge, I can first put some blue tack over that. So that's a good supply to have. Keep it in the pack just to prevent it from drying out. All right, so that's the fundamentals of before you start painting. So after you've got those kinds of supplies, the next thing you're going to want to invest in is a wet palette. Now, a wet palette does not need to be expensive at all. In fact, if we come over here, here is a homemade one. Now, it's a very simple idea. Basically, you've got something on the top, in this case, baking paper, uh, that is semi-porous. So it's kind of like an eggshell where it lets little bits of stuff in and out, although eggshells tend to be a bit more waterproof. So that's just the example there. Like a membrane, a thin membrane that you've got. And what you do is I use a plate. I cut out the shape so that there's no overhang, otherwise the water will go out with it. And then you simply, so this is kitchen paper, or paper towel, depending on which country you're in. You get the paper towel, get some water, and my very official paint bottle. You can see it's official because it has paint written on it. I bought that from the store, it's not a water bottle, but in your purpose. Pour the water on, let it go, until it's basically got most of the paper. You know, you don't want it too thick, but you do want water on the top there, and then you put the baking paper on top, and make sure there's no air bubbles. Now what's going to happen here is, you put the paint that you're working with on top, and it basically increases the life of the paint. So if you're normally using paint and it dries in 5-10 minutes, this can make it take hours, days even. I've heard days for places like the UK, and in winter, you know, overnight, I can come back and use it, but here in Australia, uh, even a few hours is fantastic because normally we're dealing with like three minutes most. And if you're mixing paints up because you're trying to get a particular, you know, style going on your miniature, it can be really frustrating trying to mix that up constantly, trying to get it just right. Now, for instance, the baking paper actually looks just like this. So this is Maltex baking paper. It does the job. You can buy one of these pre-made, but I mean, look how easy that is. I mean, occasionally I replace this kitchen paper on it, so every like two, three uses. The baking paper I replace when it starts looking dirty, but there's no water, there's no bacteria, in, well, aside from natural bacteria, in there, so it doesn't really get that dirty, so it's okay to reuse it. Uh, the important thing is you want non-wax, so just get non-stick, but if it says wax on it, that's about the only thing where you can go wrong. But always a bit of empiricism. If you're worried that the uh, baking style that you're not getting isn't working for your stuff, just put a bit of paint you know, next to here and a bit on here and just see how it goes. Uh, other stuff that you might want. Now, this is a bit of the opposite to the wet palette. Sometimes you want to do a technique called dry brushing, and um, that can be very, very important. Uh, but to do that, obviously, as the name would imply, you need a dry situation. Now, this one's quite old. I've got fresh ones, but this is the last one I was using. Uh, it's actually been quite a few months since I've used it. But anyway, uh, you put the paint on here, and it's a dry surface. And some colours, such as red, yellow, orange, just tend to be very thin and watery naturally. And putting them on a wet palette will slightly thin out your paints. And so if you've got a very watery colour and you're putting it on a wet palette, it can mean that you end up doing hundreds of layers and it just runs and it's just a bit painful. So 
for some of those colors, it's best to use it just straight from the pot, even though normally that's you know, not the best, or, or with appropriate watering. Uh, additionally, so the, the back underside of it is what I use for the dry brushing, and I also use the top here for a little reservoir of inks or washes if I'm doing like terrain pieces or, or, or a large amount of ships or something at one time. Uh, from here I can just dab in some sponge or foam or something and then put onto the miniatures. And it's just a great little multi-versatile tool. And it's free, plus you get some coffee out of it, so, you know, there's that. Uh, there are paint brushes. Believe it or not, to paint, you do in fact need paint brushes. Little known secret. That's uh, one of my, you know, deeper ones, so I'm surprised I'm giving that one away, but, you know, there you have it. To paint, you do in fact need paint brushes. Uh, Sable Kalinsky is a type of mammal. I'm not sure which one. I think it's a squirrel-like creature from recollection. But it holds the... Uh, the paint really well, it holds moisture in the bristles fantastically and it means that they really can go a lot further than just standard like a horse hair brush or something like that. But any sort of fine brush will do. They do have to be really quite fine because as you can see we're dealing with some very very small areas and you do want to be able to get in there. So a multitude of brushes are important. We'll cover brushes and all that stuff down the line. This is just an introductory, what kind of stuff are you looking for? All right, now we'll go over here, and we have a headlamp. Now, at night time, I like my light source to be consistent. I've tried painting under a light, but I haven't got official stuff, so I just use a headlamp. It is not fashionable. It does not look good. It, it, yeah, you can tell, but I'm already painting toy soldiers, so how cool can I look at any one time? So I put the headlamp on, and I wear it with pride. Magnets, very important later on, uh, for making various things switch out. So, for instance, uh, warthog gunners. I know the kits that we're getting in the uh, standard pack are going to obviously uh, only come with the chain gun, because I've made that very clear. But down the line, there's going to be warthogs where we could maybe switch out the guns, so we could have a missile hog, gorse hog, things like that, where magnets will be useful for just quick switching, and so you still get the maneuverability so you can rotate it, and that's not a problem. Uh, we can make terrain. I will cover all things like that. This is a bit of pumice that I found on the beach, and so I get the ones that look a little more like asteroids, and we paint them up. Bit of a shame, I took probably like the worst example of the painted ones to use. Now, onto actual paints. It's important before you paint, after you've washed the model and cleaned up all the mold lines, things like that, that you put a primer on them. You don't have to, but it does make it a lot easier. I airbrush this on, but I have undercoated in the past many, many times by hand. But I would recommend airbrushing, but that is a down the line thing. If you are new to this as tabletop woman gaming, I probably wouldn't invest in an airbrush, not if you don't really mind, but it does make it quicker overall. Sorry, our neighbour is uh, currently chopping up some wood for his fireplace, which is much better than the ice cream truck. I was filming this video. This is the second, third, fourth, who knows time I've done this, uh, but we had an ice cream truck. Just, it was the bane of me. Uh, I prefer grey because grey lets me work up to brighter colours, but it lets me work down to darker ones. If you go black, I tend to find that that really mutes other colours, like you'll never get a yellow. That's not true. It's difficult, but it can be done to get a yellow over black. You need lots of in-between colours, such as a nice, you know, bone white kind of colour, but sort of more matte. And then you need actual paints themselves. Paints come in various sorts. Like you can get Games Workshop ones. They're fantastic, quite mainstay. A lot of you will have access to the Games Workshop paints, but uh, I personally prefer Vallejo and War Colours because, well, honestly, I don't like Games Workshop that much. I think they overcharge for a lot of what they get, and I think more bang for the buck with these. They come in various kinds, so air you probably don't want to use unless you're using an airbrush or have a very specific application in mind. Game colour, compared to model colour, tends to be a lot brighter, so the, the idea is that these are surrealist colours, so you're not really going to get much of this jade green kind of texture in an actual uh, real life scenario, whereas the, the game colour, sorry, the model colour, tends to be aimed towards, you know, historicals and things like that. I think that pretty much covers it here. So, now, I'll do a slight summary at the end of where I hope to take this. I would like to take you guys along a trip from complete noob to a competent recruit. So some of you may have no experience whatsoever, and I'm going to try and make this as friendly for you as possible. Make sure that you have the best opportunity to really see what your miniatures can turn out like, and that you'll come to love it as much as I do. I'm doing this as a volunteer, uh, for Spartan Games, because frankly I love the Halo universe, I think it's one of the best out there. 
and when they drop ODSTs, I'm going to be so excited. But uh, yeah, I thought this would be helpful. I'll cover individual models, so I'll do marathons, I'll do epochs, I've got some of each of the models coming. We'll have painting tutorials, we'll discuss tactics. Heck, I'll even do some cosplays in here and there, so that's down the line. But anyway, I hope you enjoy, and I will put up some new videos on Halo Painting 101 very shortly. Thank you for your time.